Hi everyone, and welcome to video number 22 on the American West 1835 to 1895. And this one, ladies and gentlemen, it's about what is possibly the most famous battle in the whole period, the Key Battle, 25th of June 1876, the Battle of the Little Bighorn. Now, really, in a way, it's the end of a very, very steady, relentless build-up of tension and conflict between, on the one side, the settlers, the US Army and the US government, and on the other side, the tribes of the Plains Indians. It's been going on for many, many decades. So, we're getting right down to it. It's the final showdown. Da, 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 da. Stop there. Well, as I've mentioned, there were tensions building. What caused these tensions? Sometimes the tensions, the problems were solved only temporarily by peace treaties. But they never lasted long, ladies and gentlemen. Just to refresh our memories, here's three examples of events, situations that led to the build-up of tension, fighting, and eventually led to big horn. First one, well, they're all about gold, as we'll see. Reminds me of that old joke. There's an, an old gold digger, a gold prospector. He's been digging for years and years and years and found nothing. Then he found a tiny little piece of gold. And he said, oh, it's a minor success. <laughs> minor. No, no. Let's get down to it. Sorry. So the first example of build-up of tension, 1848, 1849, the California gold rush. Settlers crossed the Indian land. 1851, there was a treaty, the first treaty of Fort Laramie to deal with the problems. Yes, the Indians would allow settlers to cross. Yes, the Indians would allow forts to be built in return. $50,000 per year for 50 years. Second example, gold again, 1859, this time in the Rocky Mountains. The settlers rushed in onto the land of the Cheyenne tribe. 1861, a treaty, the Fort Wise Treaty. The Indians agreed to move to a smaller reservations. Some refused. And actually, there was a war. 1864, the Sand Creek Massacre. Conflict again. And the third and final example that we'll have a look at. Gold again, yet again. This time in the state of Montana. The Bozeman Trail was built or forged to actually get to the gold. But going on the Bozeman Trail... That broke the 1851 Laramie Treaty, led to yet more fighting. Red Clouds War, 1866 to 1868, solved temporarily with the second Fort Laramie Treaty, 1868. In this treaty, everyone agreed that there was a bit of land known as the Great Sioux Reservation, the Sioux Tribe of Indians. No white settlers were allowed in there. It was in the state of Dakota, and it was known as the Black Hills. No one was allowed in there. So the build-up to Little Bighorn, guess what? That promise of 1868, no settlers to be allowed in the Black Hills. Do you think that promise would be kept, ladies and gentlemen? Well... What had happened to some of the previous promises? What do you think? 1868, no settlers. Six short years later, 1874, the Northern Pacific Railroad are laying track. Where? In Dakota, near to the protected land of the Black Hills. Some of the Indians weren't happy, so they attacked. General George Armstrong Custer. There he is, leader of the 7th Cavalry. 
Custer took the 7th Cavalry to protect the rail workers who were under threat from the Indians, angry that they were in the land promised just for them. When Custer's there, guess what happens in the Black Hills? Gold was discovered. Uh-oh. Da, da, da. Well, we've seen what's happened in the past every time gold had been discovered. Would it be any different this time? What do you think? Well, as soon as gold is discovered, the news spreads. Miners, prospectors, settlers rush into the Black Hills. This was directly against the Second Fort Laramie Treaty. The Indians blamed Custer because he'd just been in the Black Hills. And now all of a sudden, gold, and now all of a sudden people are rushing into the land where they should not be. They did not like Custer for that, ladies and gentlemen. So, relations get worse. The US government offered to buy the Black Hills for $6 million. That's a lot of money. Or $400,000 per year to go and get the gold. Now you think, fair enough, take the money, take the money. But for the Lakota Sioux, ladies and gentlemen, the Black Hills were sacred. It's part of their religion. No amount of money is going to be worth that. And also, of course, the Indians said, well, you've you're breaking your promise yet again and they remembered all the previous promises so they say no we're not going to agree to this and they start to attack the miners many of the indian tribes are now very very angry many left the reservations where they had been living and they went to join two very very important indian leaders one crazy horse two sitting bull so, tension. Relations are getting worse. December 1875, the President of the United States, President Ulysses S. Grant, he gives them an ultimatum. He says to the Indians, right, you've got 60 days to go back to your reservation or we will attack you. Hmm. But two things. Number one, most of the Indians were so angry, they didn't want to go back. And number two, there'd been such deep snow that it was almost impossible to travel anyway. So they couldn't have gone back. So hardly any Indians went back to the reservations. They didn't want to. And the snow, this upset the government. Maybe, given all the snow, maybe they should have taken a chill pill. Sorry, sorry. So we get to the key year, 1876. Crazy Horse and Sitting Bull are in a camp near the Rosebud River with at least 2,000 warriors. The US Army is given the job of putting the Sioux back onto the reservations. And who will be part of that job? General George Armstrong Custer and the 7th Cavalry reporting for duty. So the army have got the task, they've got the job. Here we have the map. This was before the battle. General Terry, he's the man in total charge. He discussed the plan. General Terry's got a plan of how to win. And here's the plan here on the Yellowstone River, 21st of June 1876 involving Terry, Custer and Gibbon. At this plan, ladies and gentlemen, it was agreed, Gibbon, you go this way, all the way down the Bighorn River, taking your men with you. Custer, you go down Rosebud Creek, round the bottom of the Wolf Mountains, ladies and gentlemen, and you will come up and attack the Indians from the other side. It was a sensible plan. Basically what Terry's doing is trying to surround the Plains Indians. Given one way, 
Custer the other way. That was the plan. Now, Custer was given the longer route because he's cavalry. He's got the horses. So he can travel quicker. But the plan is to get to the Indians and attack on the 26th of June. 26th. Put that in your head, ladies and gentlemen. Before they set off, Costa was offered, why don't you take the machine guns, known as Gatling guns? Costa refused. No, they'll slow us down. We're moving quickly. But really, there would have been plenty of time for Costa to take the machine guns if he was following the plan. Just before they split, someone said to Costa, now, Costa, don't be greedy. Wait for us. Costa's reply, no, I won't. What? No, I won't be greedy. Or, no, I won't wait for us. Who knows, ladies and gentlemen. Now, General George Armstrong Custer, a very, very famous American soldier. Some say he was very ambitious. He even possibly wanted to be president of America himself. Also, Custer had recently been in trouble with the authorities. Guess what for? disobeying orders. Mm. Maybe some think, he thought, well, if I get a big win against the Indians here, I'll get back in everybody's good books. Costa disobeyed orders yet again. Remember, he's supposed to go round the bottom of the Wolf Mountains, ladies and gentlemen. But he doesn't. Costa cuts through the middle of the Wolf Mountains, which means that he is near the Indians on the 25th of June. Given on the 25th of June, following the plan, is a day away. But Custer's there, and Gibbon cannot help. It seems as if Custer has made a monkey out of Gibbon. Sorry. So, when they get towards the camp, the scouts say to Costa, right, there's Indians there. Costa says, great, we'll attack as usual. What tactics did he use? Well, he divided his group of men into three different sections. Now, he'd done this in the past. He'd used this tactic in the past, ladies and gentlemen, and it's always worked against the Indians. So probably he thought, well, it's bound to work again. So he divided his men. He had roughly about 600 men. He divides them into three sections. Section number one, led by a man called Reno. Section number two, led by a man called Benteen. Benzene had all the supplies and the ammunition, all the bullets. And the third group of 225 men would be led by Custer. And he said, right, what we'll do is we will surround the Indians. Our three groups can attack them and we will surround them and we will win and he will get his great victory. This had worked in the past. But when it had worked in the past, it was always against smaller groups of Indians. This time, there were over 2,000 warriors. Now, either Custer didn't know or Custer didn't care. Who knows? He used the same tactic. Reno is the first to go in and he sees the Indians, and he very quickly realises he's outnumbered, and he retreats, so he's not following Custer's plan. He retreats and meets up with Benteen. Benteen and Reno realise they are hugely outnumbered, so they dig in together and make their stand. They dig in for survival. They either could not or would not ride to help Custer. And remember, Benzine's got all the ammunition. 
Meanwhile, Costa rides in. My goodness me, ladies and gentlemen, he's outnumbered. Yes, he's a brave warrior. Yes, the Seventh Cavalry were good soldiers, experienced soldiers. But they're vastly outnumbered. Custer's running short of ammunition, Custer's men. Also, to make things worse, the Indians had Winchester repeating rifles. Custer's men had Springfield single-shot rifles. It meant that the Indians could fire far quicker than the army. Custer and all 225 men were killed. The Battle of Little Bighorn was lost by the American army. Why? Reasons, factors. Well, here's some for us. Remember, George Armstrong Custer. G, the Gatling guns. Custer refused them. A, he was very ambitious. Was he refusing to make common sense decisions because he's so ambitious he wanted to win? The C. Crazy Horse and Sitting Bull. Crazy Horse did most of the fighting. He led them. A very successful warrior. It's got to be said, Custer underestimated the Indians, both in their size and number, but also their tactics. Crazy Horse outsmarted Custer. And although Custer wanted to surround Crazy Horse, in the end, Crazy Horse surrounded Custer. We've seen Custer split his force into three groups. A great tactic in the past, but not that day, ladies and gentlemen. Why? Because Custer ignored Terry's plan. Gibbon was not there to help Custer because Custer had arrived a day early. Maybe because he was so ambitious, which is why he refused the Gatling guns, because he wanted to get there quickly. Who knows? The early arrival, the day the battle took place, was the 25th. It should have been the 26th. And in the battle, the Indians had the better rifles. Winchesters were better than Springfields. So there we have, ladies and gentlemen, the reasons why the Battle of Little Bighorn was a huge victory for the Indians. But what about the consequences? What happened afterwards? The Indians, short term, hooray! Massive win. Long term, defeat. Defeat followed, as we'll see. News spread across America that Custer, their national hero, had been slaughtered. The reaction, anger, shock, outrage, a demand for revenge. The United States public put pressure on the government. Before Bighorn, the idea was, yeah, come to an agreement with the Indians. After Bighorn, destroy the Indian way of life. There had been a change in the American public, which led to a change in American government policy. Strict enforcement of manifest destiny. All previous treaties ignored. Build more forts. Send in an extra 2,500 soldiers. The Cheyenne, the Sioux, could be hunted down, hassled, harried and forced back to the reservations. In the words of 1978 Blondie, great, great hit. One way or another, I'm going to get you. I'm going to get you, get you, get you, get you. And that's what the American government decided. They were going to get the Indians. Crazy Horse himself captured and killed one year later in 1877. Sitting Bull ran away took followers north to Canada. Short of food, they had to return. By 1881, Sitting Bull was on the reservation. The Sioux had to give up their weapons. Bighorn, which had been a huge win for the Indians, 
It was their last victory, ladies and gentlemen. In the long term, the Plains Indians became fully dependent on the American government for food, supplies, shelter, everything. The traditional way of life of the Plains Indians was coming to an end, as we'll see in the next couple of videos, starting with the next one, which is on something called the Massacre of Wounded Knee. As ever, I hope it's been useful. Next video coming shortly. All the best now. See you soon.